If you ever played a World War II tank game or built a model kit, you've probably seen one of these. Uh, this would be called a KV-1E or KV-1 Sakranami. But what is Sakranami? Uh, what makes this tank different from a regular KV-1? Well, keep watching this video and you'll find out. Let's start with the actual word, S means with, and then ekranami is derived from the root ekran, which is a loan word from French, where ekran means screen, so kind of like a TV screen. Uh, it's anything that sits in front of something else. So a KV-1 sakranami is KV-1 with something that sits in front of it, or add-on armor. Uh, for some reason, this is translated sometimes as spaced armor, but the Quran does not imply that there's a space between the main armor and the additional armor. Uh, on the KV-1, there was no space. Uh, this, you can see translated as add-on armor, extra armor, up armored, all of these are fine translations and I'll use them interchangeably. In the Red Army, the practice of applique armor started with the Spanish Civil War. Uh, initially, the plan was that most tanks would only have bulletproof armor, but the T-28 and T-35 heavy tanks would be protected against more powerful weapons. In this case, the most powerful anti-tank gun used at the time was the British 47mm 3-pounder, which could penetrate about 30mm of armor. However, in the Spanish Civil War, the enemy had plenty of 50 caliber machine guns and light German 37mm anti-tank guns. It might have earned itself the reputation door knocker in 1941, but at the time it could make Swiss cheese of the T-26 at any range at which you could hit. And so a solution had to be found. A long-term solution, of course, was design of a, of a new tank. And uh, you can see that in a video with military history visualized uh, where I talked about this some time ago. But, uh, well, you needed a short-term solution, and that solution was applique armor. T-26, T-28, BT-7, and T-35 were chosen as candidates to receive this armor. Uh, in the case of the T-35, it was simply too heavy and no armor was ever produced. In the case of the BT-7, uh, it was quite a complicated shape of the hull and really you couldn't make any kind of design that was satisfactory, unfortunately. But with the T-26 and T-28, a satisfactory design was found after all. With the T-28, the additional armor improved its protection to 50 to 60 millimeters on the front and 40 millimeters on the sides. This was about on par with the German Panzer IV that would see service a couple of years later. So pretty decent protection for a medium tank of the late 1930s. You sometimes see this tank called T-28E, uh, just shortening the word Dekran to E, but at, in period documents, this designation never actually appears. Uh, the E suffix was a post-war invention. This was a relatively rare conversion. Only 28 vehicles of this type were ever completed, but nevertheless, they were used in battle. With the T-26, the answer is kind of more complicated. There was an official design, which uh, had this curious solution of rather than adding armor to the gun mantlet, simply adding a hole in this shell that went over the entire turret. Uh, but there were other designs. There were conversions continued after the war broke out. So it's harder to estimate how many T-26 tanks with additional armor were ever built. But this solution improved the protection of the T-26 to about 40 millimeters, which was also a pretty fair protection for a light tank at the time. And so this was a way to modernize existing vehicles until the Red Army got this. This is a KV-1. It has 75 millimeters of protection all around. This protected it pretty much from any known anti-tank weapons. Uh, as the Winter War demonstrated, it was very resistant to the 37 millimeter gun. And Soviet trials showed that, yeah, this was very good protection against the 45 millimeter gun and short 76 millimeter guns. So... You have a really, really well-protected tank. How much more armor could you possibly need? The answer came from Soviet intelligence in March of 1941. They reported that the Germans were working on new super heavy tanks, which would feature a gun up to 105 millimeters in caliber. Now, this was true in a way. The Germans were working on 105 millimeter tank guns, but these were short guns 
howitzers really uh, designed for firing smoke shells. However, the Soviets did not know that. They thought that the gun the Germans chose was the 105mm Flak 39, which was a very powerful anti-aircraft gun. And so they set out to design a tank that could fight a cannon like this. Uh, and that wasn't easy. There were actually three tanks designed, the KV-3, which would be produced in 1941, the KV-4 and KV-5, which would be produced in 1942. And then in 1942, large scale trials would be held to see which one of these tanks would earn the right to be the Red Army's next heavy tank. In the meantime, a temporary solution had to be made. And well, applique armor was the name of the game once again. A meeting was held at the Jora factory. Uh, this was the factory that provided Kirov factory with hulls and turrets. And they came up with this layout. Uh, you had 30 millimeter thick additional armor on the turret and 25 millimeter thick on the hull. Uh, on the turret and on the side of the hull here, uh, there's plates above the fender line and also below it. Uh, these were bolted on onto bolt carriers that were welded to the main armor. On the front, uh, this armor was actually welded directly to the hull. Uh, there was no armor on the back in part to save on weight because this was actually a fairly hefty armor package. Um, the armor itself plus the bolts required to carry it weighed almost three tons, which increased the weight of the KV-1 from 45 tons to 48 tons. Now, this type of vehicle turned out to be relatively rare. In fact, photographs of only 122 distinct vehicles of this type are known today. That is because work to replace the turret with applique armor began pretty much immediately as soon as the turret went into production. The problem is that two armor plates sandwiched together are never going to be as effective as one thick armor plate. And so replacement was needed. Uh, this was a turret with 90 millimeter thick armor that was just welded together from 90 millimeter thick sheets rather than two layers. Even these tanks retained some applique armor. Uh, so applique armor around the sides was kept. It was extended upwards to serve as slash protection and the armor welded to the front was also retained. Interestingly enough, the thickness of this armor was quite variable. It could range from 30 millimeters all the way up to 90 millimeters, suggesting that rather than making this as purpose-made armor plates, this was actually put together from cast-offs that were cut off uh, when cutting hull or turret armor. This is actually shown quite well on the KV-1 tank that was sent to the UK for testing in 1943 where the front applique armor is 31 millimeters thick, so pretty close to the nominal thickness, but the side armor is actually 77 millimeters thick, as thick as the main side armor of the hull. As with the T26 and the T28, none of these variants have ever been called KV-1E during the war. This index was only invented afterwards. So how effective was this armor? Uh, well, the Germans come in handy here uh, as their air penetration guides had both the original KV-1 and the KV-1 verstärkt or strengthened. In this case here you see that the 37 millimeter door knocker can penetrate the front of a KV-1 tank without applique armor only if it uses subcaliber tungsten carbide shot it could penetrate from 100 meters. Uh, if applique armor is used it can't penetrate at all. Similarly, with this ammunition, the 37 millimeter gun can penetrate the side of the tank from 100 meters, uh, but if applique armor is used, then it can't penetrate at all. The applique armor also had some effect against a 50 millimeter gun. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a guide with full applique armor, but in this case, the KV-1C verstärkt uh, or a late production KV-1 with a cast turret still retains applique armor in the front, so we can compare the effectiveness there. Uh, the 50 millimeter gun, again using tungsten carbide shot, can penetrate the front from between 50 and 100 meters if there is no applique armor, but if there is applique armor, then this type of gun is entirely ineffective. The difference becomes quite visible when the 75mm Pac-40 gun is employed. With this gun, the sight can be penetrated at a range of 1,000 meters. However, if applique armor is used, the effective range of penetration drops all the way to between 100 and 300 meters, depending on which part of the tank you hit. 
The effect of Applicate Armor is also mentioned in tests of the Henschel HS-129, a ground attack aircraft equipped with the 30mm MK-101 gun. During trials, the gun couldn't penetrate the tank's armor, even if it hit in very favorable conditions at angles close to normal. Conclusions to this trial say that the gun is effective at suppressing Russian heavy tanks without extra armor at ranges of under 400 meters. As you can see, the additional armor actually turned out to be quite useful, even though the super heavy tanks that it was intended to be used against never turned up in the battlefield, the Germans still had quite powerful anti-tank weapons. The additional armor continued to be effective, even against weapons introduced in 1942. However, the Germans weren't asleep at the wheel and continued to make more and more powerful guns. As for the KV-1, it was impossible to just keep bolting more armor onto it since the tank was already quite overweight. And in 1942, it had to make way for a new generation of heavy tanks. Even though this was quite a rare tank on the Eastern Front, it did not go unnoticed by the Germans. And it's not hard to see why. The applique armor turned the KV-1, which was already a, quite a hard nut to crack, into an even more powerful opponent.